You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 66, Ricardo Matrani and the Evil in Dentistry. In this episode, we interview Ricardo Matrani of Spear Education, who is widely published author and speaker. Together with Darren Deister, who has also been on the show, Dr. Matrani teaches the seminar on treating the terminal dentition and fully edentulous patients. We set out to discuss their recent publication, Lip, Tooth, Ridge Classifications for the Edentulous Patient. He covered that topic very well, but once he got to know us, he took the interview in a very different direction, and we saw his passion for dentistry come out in full force. What is the evil in dentistry. You'll have to listen to this one to find out this week on The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by The Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, The Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call one 800 472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. And by Restorative Driven Implants. Understand, place, restore, and implement dental implant treatment from John and Wes, the dental guys. Go to restorativedrivenimplants.com right now to sign up for the next series of courses and take your implant education to the next level. And just one more quick little thing. After the last show where we featured Zerk's locking trays as the product of the week, Zerk contacted us and said they'd love to do a promo for listeners of The Dental Guys. So they said if you go to Zerk.com and order the locking trays, they will do a five plus one, that's buy five, get one of the locking trays with promo code DG5, that's DG5. Go to Zerk.com. If you do call them, tell them that The Dental Guys sent you. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. And we are live from Spear Education's campus, and we're excited about this week's episode, being able to broadcast this live and bring you guys an exclusive interview with one of our favorite clinicians. Yeah, we're here with Dr. Ricardo Matrani, um, who is uh, one of the members of the Spear resident faculty. And... Uh, we're excited to get to spend some time with Dr. Mitrani because we've been following a lot of the things that he's been doing here at Spear. I want to tell you a little bit about him for those of you who are not familiar with him. Um, he's authored numerous scientific publications and chapters and textbooks uh, in the field of implant prosthodontics and aesthetic dentistry, lectures all over the world, uh, and also holds academic affiliation at the National University of Mexico and University of Washington, maintains a private practice uh, limited to prosthodontics and implants in Mexico City. Uh, and uh, we're excited, especially we've been reading, you know, some of his publications, and that's something we're going to get to later on. And so we're really honored uh, to have uh, Dr. Matrani here with us. Thank you yeah, for welcome being with to us the today. show. Thank you. Thank you. Both. So I'd like to get right into it and really talk to you a little bit about um, your patient population in Mexico City and what is their implant IQ and what what level of implant you know knowledge does this patient population have. You know, it's, it's a great question and uh, perhaps something that will be mind-blowing for you guys and your audience to, to think about is that you know, Mexico City is probably the one city in the world with the uh, largest amount of U.S. trained specialists, dental specialists. Really? Yes. And uh, you know, as crazy as it may sound, but, but um, you know, probably larger specialist population than most mainstream, like, large cities in the U.S. Huh. So it's, it's, it's crazy because wow. uh, that right there tells you that there's, there's a lot of really well-educated clinicians. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, on the other hand, it's a country that, uh, as, as you go into high-end dentistry, of course, uh, unfortunately, high-end dentistry cannot be inexpensive, can, cannot mm. be that affordable. And so um, our population in Mexico, um, as you know, it's, um, you know, we have the richest, but we also have some of the poorest people. Mm. And so our middle class is, is, is not as broad as, as perhaps it is in the U.S. And so we have a large population of clinicians um, that are, quote, unquote, competing to get, you know, those patients that can afford high-end dentistry. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, as far as the dental IQ, it's, uh, it's getting higher and higher. Patients are, as in any other place in the world, they're, they're starting to get, you know, educated and, and they know what they want or at least they think they know. 
you mm-hmm, want. And, mm-hmm. uh, and they'll, they'll come in requesting specific treatment modalities as, as is happening here in the U.S. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So really, it's uh, like you say, it's a lot like any large city. For with sure. uh, with con- And again, it sounds like competitive environment. You, you have bet. to be on your game. You well, John, you and I, John practices in an area that's a little more rural yeah, than I do. Yeah, small town. And we talk about this all the time is that my, my uh, colleagues and I, I have to work a little harder because my patients, not that John's not working harder. No, no, I but, understand. <laughs> but from a standpoint of like my patients come in and they really know what's available to them. Mm-hmm. And it's different because I'm in a city that's around 400 some thousand people and John's, uh, you know, yeah, John's 15,000. 15, <laughs> and so the, it's different, right. but he still does the same dentistry sure. that I'm doing. And, uh, and it sounds like you're doing a lot of high end dentistry there. And, yeah, and uh, we want to talk to you a little bit about that type of dentistry. Yeah, today. yeah. Well, we're really, you know, we know that one of your passions is full arch implant treatment, and uh, we know that that's been a part of your publications, part of your teaching here mm-hmm. at Spear. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we we've we've talked a lot on our show about full arch treatment, and we one of the things that I'd like to get right into, as far as some nuts and bolts, is you know discussions on prosthetic choices for the full arch. You know, there's so many choices out there. And um, we had an interesting discussion with uh, one of your colleagues, Darren Deister, about uh, full arch treatment options. And one of the things that Darren said was he said the maxilla is the Wild West. You know, he said (laughs) there are a lot of different approaches to treating the edentulous maxilla. Um, he meant he mentioned uh, something we were a little surprised by really when we when he said it was you know he really likes the unsplinted telescopic custom abutment friction fit type of prosthetics mm-hmm. uh, like the Deutsch uh, kind of approach mm-hmm. and uh, that was interesting to us um, now that prosthetic design has got some advantages and disadvantages I guess what I'd like you to speak to is you know how has your practice changed as far as the options that you're maybe doing now more than you were doing ten years ago as far as technology changes, what are some of the things that you're that you're doing more of now? You know, I was, I was talking actually with, with Darren uh, a while ago, and um, we were saying how the problem with um, simplification or the risk of simplifying things is when you um, go ahead and oversimplify, mm. because that right there, I mean, you are you lose a lot of visibility of what are the things that need need to be considered. And so when you when you talk about what's the preferred design, um, well, what is the preferred design based on what? Mm. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure the maxilla, as, as, as <clears throat> Darren pointed out, it's the Wild West. There are a ton of different options. And again, as, as clinicians and as educators, you know, there's this great book that I love called The Paradox of Choice um, by Barry Schwartz, a uh, uh, well-known therapist. Uh, and so what what this book says is that if we give, you know, a buyer or a patient um, numerous options, the more options we give, um, the more there's a chance that they'll regret the choice that they took. Mm-hmm. And so we as clinicians and as, as we're looking at potential options, you know, it's it's – Counterproductive to offer too many options, so we have to narrow down, you know, the options. So that's when Darren and I, as we were putting together our seminar, which is a two-day seminar that specifically discusses, the, you know, the uh, treatment planning of these type of patients. Is yes. so how do we make something that's appealing for the dentist to be able to understand, you know, what are the the clinical um, implications, but and, and what are, what is the what are the different scenarios, if you will, mm-hmm. and what are the, the different things that we need to take into account in order for us to be able to pick and choose what is the ideal design, right? And so um, that right there is the only, you know, intelligible way that we came up with that does give you a linear thought process. Mm. And so because part of the problem that we, we see in dentistry, and I'm sure you guys have seen it over and over over the years that you've been clinicians, but <clears throat> also in this show, is that we like to stick with one flavor. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then we become champions of doing one technique. That's and, a good point. Yes. And, and, and you know, um, at the end of the day, you know, one technique may be phenomenal if and when the stars align, if and when the clinical situations and the, um, the patient's so the way we break it up is, um, so we're talking about the maxilla, right? So there's three fundamental uh, ways that a patient may present it to us in 
you know, in the office. It could either A, patient may have a terminal dentition, which means we have a bunch of teeth that are going to be extracted. Mm -hmm. B, we have a patient that's already a dentulous and has a denture. Or C, we have a patient that already comes with some type of implant ill-conceived design that we have to now, <laughs> you know, work around and redo. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Is that is that a first that's, statement? Yeah, that's absolutely. Good. So that would be the, 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 first, the first parameter. Okay, so how the, the, the presentations that the patient presents. Secondly, we'll look at etiology, which means why did the patient either is about to lose their teeth or has lost their teeth. And I think that's important that we as clinicians don't forget why a patient you got bet. where we where we are right, right. now. Right. And you, you I, I think that, that's so good that you brought that up because in teaching dentists, it's important to know why we are at this point because you bet. things fail. And it could be for the same reason that their teeth failed. We're putting a prosthetic in their mouth you and bet. we don't want it to fail. So go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that, that why right there, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a fundamental principle. And so going back to etiology, so we have a patient that, for instance, uh, lost their teeth due to rampant decay. You know, these patients typically are going to have a lot of bone. Right. Mm, right. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they have a lot of bone, now you got to think about, okay, if I want to stick to X, Y, or Z design, now I have to create the space because this is my favorite choice. So now right. we're going to end up removing a, a lot of bone, which perhaps wouldn't be what the patient would really want. Mm. So, so again, we, we, lose our, the, we, we may lose teeth out of decay or mm -hmm. um, extra, structural reasons. We may have a patient that has advanced periodontal disease, which right there, for the most part, you're going to see patients that have already experienced a lot of attachment loss, right. bone loss. So space right there is created. Right. Then you have patients that may be you know, uh, on the verge of losing their teeth because of heavy-duty parafunction. And again, these patients typically, sometimes they have too much bone. They have like almost buttressing bone sometimes. Right, right. And so again, right there, that's that would be the second parameter, okay? So we started with, um, again, is it terminal? Is it edential? Is, is it ill-conceived? Secondly, we went, about, went through etiology, right? And the third part would be the condition, which is what we call um, the, and this, that ties with our classification called the LTR classification, mm. which, which mm. again gives you uh, a lot of the information that you you could guess from from the other two options. Um, but still, so what does LTR mean? LTR means um, it, it was a very ingenious idea uh, that was put together by Adrian Pellini, who's a phenomenal periodontist, prosthodontist, who trained in, in Kentucky. Uh, Jack Goldberg, who, uh, who trained in USC, is a phenomenal prosthodontist, and then he did his fellowship uh, um, also in, in, in Louisville, who, who happens to be now my, my partner in the office in Mexico. And these guys came to me and says, Ricardo, we're thinking about, you know, putting this together. So I, I was privileged to be invited to the, you know, to that team and, 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 and again, ask the questions and give them the angle as a clinician that has been dealing with these patients for quite a long time. So we came up with this LTR. And LTR stands for Lip Tooth Ridge Classification. And um, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, you, you guys have been, trained at Spear for many, many years. You guys are perfectly um, familiar with the <clears throat> EFSB and how we treat patients from a facially generated standpoint. Well, our LTR really ties in very nicely with, with these concepts. Because yeah, yeah, and that was something that, you know, when we were when we were excited, one of the reasons we are excited to speak with you is because we read these journals. And so we saw this article come out and like you say, it fit perfectly with what we're already doing with facially generated treatment plan. It was one more thing that we needed to add. To take into account. To yeah. take into account. Uh, and in the same discussion, when we're looking at these terminal dentition types of patients or dentalist patients, to make sure that the prosthetic design will make sense and that we're not taking away bone where we don't need to you or bet. where we already have the bone missing. So, yeah, this was – it's really exciting to, to see. This is a very modern – article this just was you know came out yeah, or, yeah a couple months ago just a couple months ago so that's one th i just want to point that out that for listeners you know who are watching this this is where we are right now so right. i'm sorry i want to let you continue but i just want to point out this is not something that you just you guys just came up with in your in the basement and it's just your thing this is out there now and maybe a classification that will become a standardization for looking at these types of cases. So that's no small thing. I know you wouldn't say that, but we can say that Definitely. because we're excited about that. We so are anyway, excited. Yeah, I, so. I, I want to say one thing is just that the cohesion that this has with already of what you may have been taught at Spear, what right. John and I have been taught, right. this fits right in with that. You're going to be able to read this and understand this. So yeah. go ahead and yeah, continue. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, th thank you. That's very, very nice of both of you to say. Um, 
the reality is, as you know, and as the audience knows, you know, us dentists are so used to hearing classification after classification after classification. Mm. And in dentistry, everything is class one, class two, class three. Mm-hmm. Right? And so we're always, always, always expecting, oh, yeah. Class four is right. really bad. Then, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. If it gets to four, right. it's bad. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So again, classifications are meaningful or they are meaningless mm. provided what you make out of them. And so in fairness, I mean, uh, throughout the last 40 years, so many great authors have looked into, again, ridge defects. I mean, in, in fact, one of the most utilized classification, of course, is the Seberg classification that describes, you know, defects, you know, post-extraction defects, mm-hmm. you know? And, of course, class one being a vertical defect, class two being a horizontal, class three being a combination of. And so our classification doesn't mean to reinvent a wheel, um, what it, and, and again, a bunch of other authors have, have looked at, you know, rich defects and have looked at, you know, what potentially could be the best way to handle, you know, a ridge when you want to do a fixed type of solution. What we decided to do is to take a step back and diagnose the patient's condition and based on the condition, perhaps give recommendations of what would be the most uh, suitable prosthetic design or what would it entail to, based on a um, um, determined situation, what would it entail for us to give a different prosthetic design? Let me try to explain. So um, as, as you all know, uh, one of a very, very popular uh, solution out there is a fixed hybrid, right? It's, it's, it's gaining a lot of traction, it works. It, it's it's relatively uh, inexpensive or less expensive that you know thinking about you know a full arch a full fixed arch with zirconia a bunch of more more implants so we're basically are able now to provide a great solution on on four implants and we're tilting the implants mm-hmm. which for me was a tremendous breakthrough and me being you know uh, how should I say traditionally trained prosthodontist from the University of Washington um, in the late 90s, you know, for us to think about tilting implants and, and doing, uh, you know, these type of prostheses, I was um, challenged. Not not quite the early adapter, in that, right? In that <laughs> yeah. Challenged, design. which is a right. healthy approach, I think. Right. Yeah, you know, you, you don't want to be the first to necessarily do something. Uh, maybe the some people have to be trailblazers, but sometimes it's good right. to take take a step yeah. back we'll and let, just wait. We'll right? let Paula Mala do a few cases, right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what happens before we <laughs> exactly a few, a few thousand cases. Yeah. Here, right. yeah. for sure. But 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 again, I mean, for us, I mean, we we were, we're questioning the engineering. We're, questioning the biomechanics, but, sure. but again, it's a proven concept, as we all know, proven concept that, that still needs to be tweaked here and there as anything else. And again, for, for, for us, it is a patient-based uh, um, solution, which, which mm. means, like I said, I mean, I, I, I told you, and I haven't quite finished, what are, what are the clinical aspects that we look into mm-hmm. uh, that allow us to, you know, uh, get the information and put it <clears throat> together uh, in order for us to come up with what we feel would be ideal for a patient. But then, again, of course, there has to be some personal data collection as well. We have to s- almost see, you know, the level of compliance. I guess the right term today is adherence. Mm-hmm. Uh, the mm-hmm. patient's going to adhere to whatever we uh, we we um, lay out as, you know, the behavior, the hygiene instructions. I mean, the patient has to be pretty much in tune with what we let them know is to be expected. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, of course, patients' finances. So all these things play, you know, into the equation. And so, again, at the end of the day, what our classification does is that based on, um, like I said, the, the what does LTR mean? So again, yeah, let's break it down. Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah, let's yeah, break it down. Yeah, I think so that'd be good to break it down for the viewers. Yeah. So your audience, of course, uh, all or all, all dentists, we're so used to looking at tooth position, right? So that's where it all, all begins. Mm-hmm. And tooth position uh, relative to the lip, mm-hmm. right? That, that's that's a very solid starting point. That's that's the principle behind facially generated treatment. Yeah, where eight and nine goes. Yeah, yeah. Where yeah. eight and nine goes in the patient's face. Right. Right. So here the drape. The curtains of the the stage, of course, are the lips. So we want to look at the lips. We want to see tooth position relative to the lips. Now, what is really critical about the lips, of course, is 
um, the lip support. And think, think about when we're losing teeth, we lose lip support. And so it's critical for the teeth to support the lip, mm -hmm. right? So we, we, we have averages of how much we want the lip to be, you know, uh, in repose, the, the this display in repose and, and upon uh, full smile. But, but again, so one would be the, the lip support. And the second very important deal is the lip mobility. Mm -hmm. So when looking at these patients, we want to make sure that depending on the ridge deficiency, okay, as a patient gives us a full-blown smile, we want to make sure that that interface between mm -hmm. the prosthesis and whatever's remaining in the ridge is not visible because we all know that it's next to impossible to hide such transition line. Right. Yep. So that right there, it's critical because we want to make sure that we understand, again, tooth position relative to that lip. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? So one, that is checked, and we go for the relationship between, again, the tooth and the ridge. What type of ridge do we have? And so, of course, if we have what we call a class one or a no defect, and again, this, this calls for us to think about it for a second because we all know that when we extract teeth, there's going to be a residual defect. So <clears> when we say no defect, it's either A, you know, extractions were handled, you know, very, very carefully with, with um, no buckle plate loss, no though. buckle plate loss mm -hmm. and connective tissue grafting sure. and, mm -hmm. and, or even some ridge uh, management with some forced eruption or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ponic or, shaping at its finest. Exactly. Or B, we, we started out with a patient that had vertical maxillary yeah. access. Excellent. So there, right. was, there was a ton of tissue to begin with. So it's a, you know, it's a good day in practice. Yeah. Now we're, right. Now we're able yeah. to lose Thick some biotype. tissue. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. Or we had short clinical crowns, you know, yeah. that. Could, could have been lengthened. So, yeah, again, those, those are the scenarios that we all crave for this. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's how we came up with, with a class one, if you will. Um, and a class two, which would be your typical, uh, you know, defect. And, again, I mean, between class two, three, and four, typically you'll find a defect that has – there may be a vertical defect, and but there also may be – quite some horizontal component, but sometimes you have more of a horizontal component, mm. and sometimes we do have more of a vertical component, mm -hmm. right? So, so basically, what, what does class two mean? Well, it means that, again, from a, from a prosthetic design standpoint, we know that whatever we deliver is going to have some pink prosthetic. Call it acrylic, call it ceramics, we know, call it a flange, mm -hmm. we know that there's going to be some, some pink associated. Yes. Okay? Right, because you're replacing what was lost. Right. Correct. Not just yeah, not when just you get white, to class two, you know it's not just white. Yeah, yeah. correct. We got you. And, and so, and, and again, so we know that from that standpoint, there's going to be some pink. Now the challenge is again to tie it into the lip. Mm. Right. What is the lip displaying here? Right. Where's the is junction? Is this guy working for us or against <clears throat> us? Is he mm -hmm. our ally or not? Mm -hmm. So as far as lip mobility and, and again lip support, which leads to class three. What if now we have that horizontal deficiency, and while we go ahead and put some pink we do see some collapse of the lip that we're it's just not doing it for something fixed. And so we end up either creating a tremendous shelf, mm -hmm. which is not going to be, you know, hygiene friendly. Mm -hmm. And the patient will ultimately will complain that it, it, he or she does not have enough lip support. And now, you know, uh, we only offered something fixed. So from that end, it gets messy to now start communicating to the patient, well, you know what? Um, we're going to end up giving you something removable. Right. Which, again, nothing wrong with removable. Thank removal, you for saying that. Removable right. could right. be the best option. And again, I mean. And that's one of the things that we see is that, you know, there's a drive, and you, you know, there's, there's lots of discussion about why, but there's a drive maybe from some outside forces as to this fixed approach uh -huh. that we can just do this in everybody. And we see a lot, especially in the general dentist world, yep. where maybe they've not had training in decision making for this. And so everything is full art zirconium. Everything, and, and there you see advertisements in our throwaway journals for. Well, this is this is the solution for full arch edentulous patients, and I, it's really really important. I think that you mentioned. You know, there's even one person out there who says, "Well, I've eliminated all removable oh my from God. my practice. There is no such thing as a removable appliance in my implant practice doing full arch." And this is your well, some well known folks saying that, and it's important that we we say, "Well, that's not going to work in every case. Not at least not from a cleansability standpoint." And from unless, a or an anterior cantilever is created, or unless you have such high-end interdisciplinary practice that you submit your patients to grafting 
and get the tissue where you need to get get it in right. order for you to be able to, right. to provide. Yeah. Everybody becomes a class one. Exactly. Or, yeah. Right. Yes, yes. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, right. and we know that that's a long treatment modality. Right. A long haul. Right. It and can involve long orthopedic surgery. I mean, it, right. it can you get, you, you can bet. get, you bet. and you can do it, like you, you can say. do it. Yeah, but that's not but what, that's we're, not talking what we're talking about. about. We're talking about the cases that are oh. a class three you bet. that are being restored with fixed. And I think it's important that we say, you know, this classification allows for before you're prescribing a prosthetic for the patient, mm. that this is a communication tool for you to the patient, you to the surgeon, so that there's not an expectation that's you set. Bet. Uh, before you really know where you're going. And one thing about class two is that you don't have a horizontal defect at this point. And or so, not, not as critical. There not will be critical. some remodeling, which you'll be able to provide support mm-hmm. with. That, the enough thing. lip support right. enough that support, you wouldn't have right. to replace So at that. what point, I guess, from class one to class two, does that change our – what would change our treatment choice as far as like – you know, what prosthetic we give this patient, Great. whether it's removable or fixed or a con- yeah. Great question. And again, it has to do with that second factor that we spoke about. So think about this. Uh, class one, class two, you, you got to understand or you got to assess what is the aesthetic risk, mm. which means, and that's basically <clears throat> given by lip mobility. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So even in a class one, as, as, as you know, if we are providing a and, and with class one, let's think about this. It's an all-white solution, no pink. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if it's no pink, we better know what we're doing as far as, you know, soft tissue management. Uh, and we got to create papilla. You, you, mm-hmm. you bet, or pseudopapilla. You yeah. Know, so mm-hmm. you, you, you're going to have, and, and again, it, it ties back to how the patient presented. So, so, so again, you, you need to give that interproximal tissue some type of support across, you know, the, the, the art. So it, it, it does provide some harmony or, or symmetry, sure. mm-hmm. okay, which is challenging. Very we, challenging. We love those challenges, but again, it's so much easier if and when we have, you know, mm. the, the conditions are right. Yes. Right? So converting a class two to class one, I mean, sometimes it's, it's, there's phenomenal um, surgical challenges involved that you have to, you know, do a lot of connective tissue grafting. You have to work with pontics. You have to think of where to place the implants, all that fun right. stuff, you know? So, so, so again, the other thing about class two is that class two can be a couple of, of pink, a couple of millimeters of pink, mm-hmm. or you can have, you know, five, six millimeters of pink. Sure. Right. Right. And so right there, um, if you have way more, uh, sometimes you may think more towards some, something along the lines of a fixed hybrid. But, but, but again, I mean, th- these are like uh, stackable linear processes that you start looking at so you start developing the sense of what you feel would be the best right. prosthetic design for the three patients. So so bottom line what what Darren and I did was okay let's let's try to narrow it down. Sure. Looking at again this paradox of choice. Let's yes. not let's not throw there, you know, a ton, ten different d- prosthetic designs. Right. Because we we're gonna confuse you know, if, if, if you cannot say something that's clear enough that, that a lay person can, can understand, there's a very good chance, and I don't, and, and I mean this in a very, very positive way, we educate dentists. Yes. We are, and we're dentists that want to be educated ourselves. Right. right. So we don't want to play a confusing game. I agree. Because if you are not able to explain something that it's very clear cut, it means you yourself don't understand it that way. I think that's the superiority of, of an educational institution like Spear. Yeah. Is yeah. that they pare it down into a few simple choices classifications but in that this ha- case. But that has, that's difficult. I, yeah, it's because, very hard. Because it takes there a special are, person. You because there that. are so many options, and, and that's evolving. Um, so it had to be a challenge for you and Darren to be able to uh, cut it down to the point where you can have success in the majority of cases right. and yet still know when to ask the right questions to, to change the design. You bet. Um, so, so did that mean that you arrived at a, a few designs that you, that you maybe talk about the most in right. your courses? And so, so basically we break it up, we break it down to three potential designs. Okay. So we say, so we're going to have either the removable design mm-hmm. and in the removable world, of course, you can have like bar clips, you can have the telescopes that, that Darren spoke about. You can have, you know, any, anything that you know is going to come out. Then we have the fixed hybrid, which is, for the most part, you can see that you're having now a screw-retained restoration um, that's going to have a titanium framework, and there's going to be some type of wraparound. Most likely it's going to be, you know, denture teeth and, and acrylic. Although, also today, we're, we're, we're doing, um, we're, and we're seeing more and more of also zirconium, uh, you know, hybrids, mm-hmm. which again, what does the hybrid mean? 
it means that it, it has it lives in a world of both <coughs> it's removal it's fixed but then again you know what is the the third option which is what's called the implant supported fixed down prosthesis and the reality and the way that we break it up so it's clear for our audience to understand is well, basically, it's a, it's a higher-end prosthesis. We place more implants, and so the fixed hybrid we're considering, you know, four, five, depending, and again, again on the ridge deficiency, depending on, right. the, on the ridge. Mm -hmm. um, so well, class one, you might be able to do segmental. You, you know, bet. Right? You Cla bet. Class two, you're maybe looking more at, like, a fixed, you know, hybrid. Um, yes. based on lip reveal and that kind of thing. And then when you get into class three, you've got significant uh, lip support that's needed by bone loss because you have a horizontal now. You bet. And, now. That, and that's where the telescope is the what we feel would be a, an ideal right. way to go. Mm -hmm. We're, we're going to bring Darren back on to talk more about that because yeah. we really are interested in yeah. that prosthetic uh, yeah, process. Yeah, because it's very, you know, one of the things, and, and we won't go down that rabbit hole too far, yeah. but, you know, when you start getting into some of those prosthetic designs, this is obviously much more challenging. For some of these, are more challenging from a lab perspective and a clinical perspective as well, versus others. And so we have to also know what our limitations are as clinicians and what our limitations are from a lab perspective as well to make sure that we match the not only the prosthetic design with the patient, but also with our own yeah. uh, abilities and limitations. And that's something that I think you guys are trying to increase you know, the abilities and decrease the limitations of the clinical ability and, and, and that communication between the surgeon and the restorative dentist. Because once you decide on this design or you decide on a couple of possible designs, mm -hmm. now you have to start discussing imp how many implants do we need, implant, implant. position, um, you know, how do, we how do we determine provisionalization? Um, these are all next level you bet. from that. Yeah. You bet. So, so one thing that we, we talk about, and I'm, you know, very, very adamant about trying to convey this message that hopefully resonates, you know, in our students and those clinicians that take our courses. Um, there is this evil preconceived notion, this what I call, you know, the, the biggest dental lie, hmm. which is patients come in, you know, to the dental office saying implants are forever, right? Oh, oh, did you hear what he just said? <clears throat> evil. It, it, it is because, it is you know evil. what? It is encrypted in the minds of s thousands, I would say millions of patients. Mm. Yep. And who who is it to blame? Well, for sure, a colleague of ours that at some point said it. Right. But now we're fighting. <laughs> you know, um, Goebbels, who was, you know, the, the and I'm going to use a very, very um, compelling example here, but th this guy was the chief of propaganda, the Nazi propaganda, mm. you know, back in the Second World War. And he said something along the lines of, if you tell a lie enough times, it becomes true. Oh, mm. man. So this is crazy because now we have these patients. So, so think about this for a second. We have all these patients that are coming in and they're hurting, you know? I mean, they had their chance with natural dentition, and for some reason, whether whether they are to blame or not, whether it was out of neglect or whatever you want, mm -hmm. but now you have what we call terminal dentition. And again, just right there, the concept of terminal dentition, we could talk all day about what does it mean, terminal mm -hmm. dentition, mm -hmm. right? Does it mean that we can no longer save teeth? Well, again, so for Darren and myself, the concept of terminal dentition is, you know, regardless of the, possibi the possibility of keeping some teeth here and there, from a treatment management standpoint, we would be more, um, it would be more convenient, and convenience is a word that we, we, we should utilize, but understand how to utilize it. For patient's convenience and clinical clinicians or, or the clinical team convenience, we, we choose to remove those teeth to provide a solution that we feel will work better. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that yeah. totally understandable? Yeah, that's fair. Oh, okay. yeah. So from that standpoint, patients that are, have such terminal dentition or patients that are edentulous, we need to educate them and realize that we do a very good job and, and we should be very, very proud that dentistry is providing incredible solutions. But when you look at, and I'm, I'm writing a piece for our digest, um, Spear Digest here that precisely talks about that. When, when you look at... Um, body part replacements, and you look outside the mouth, mm. you look at prosthetic limbs, mm. go, to, go to a website called amputee.org, and you'll see that these prosthetic limbs, I mean, are not promised for more than a couple, three years maybe. Mm. When you look at hip replacement, when you look at breast implants, when you look at 
I prosthet, prosthesis. Where on earth is it written that all these replacements are going to be forever? And mm. yet, we all have patients that are coming in, and <clears throat> when they hear implants, they come back at us and say, that's forever, right, doc? I mean, think about it for a second. When was the last time you had a discussion with a patient? When was the last time you had a discussion with a patient? Happens all the time. Yeah. All Re the time. And regardless of you guys, you know, practicing in Tennessee, practicing in Calgary, practicing in Oklahoma, or practicing in Taipei, you know? I mean, this is universal. I've had the privilege of lecturing all over the map, and I'll tell you, this is a recurrent uh, again, um, it's a real, it's a real it problem. It is, and I remember, you know, at the AO a couple of years ago, there was a whole lecture about the the terminology that they used was revisions. That we need to be talking about our implant surgery the same way that John and plastic I surgeons talk about in. saying, "Hey, yeah. look, you know, we're going to do this." facial procedure, for instance, and you may need a revision in the future. And that was the terminology they used to, but, and, and it's, it's, it's difficult though, I think, because as you say, there's so many people out there that are talking about this as a permanent solution. Oh my God. And how, and how wrongly so. Again, think about it for a second. And, and this is, a, again, a discussion that I have with each and every one of my patients, because I feel that, that we have to, you know, pause for a second and have this discussion and they, they have to own it because if they don't, Whichever solution you're providing, potentially, is going to be the, a wrong solution. Hmm. What, what's wrong with us telling our patients a prognosis? When uh, you, you go to have heart bet. surgery, yeah. they tell us you that the bet. prognosis is good, better, fair, poor. Right. And the outcomes and the length of that we might have to come back and do certain things. And there's certain upkeeps. But we as dentists have been fixers ingrained to just say we can get rid of that and we can fix that. And it's... It's not a, we're that good, right? We're right. that good. Because we, wanna, we want we to be able be, to say we're fixed. But you. what's wrong with having to do a revision? Is it saying that we're a failure, Ricardo? Well, is it is it that? Yeah, is, that, well, is, yeah, that is, is, is it that that's causing this not to be discussed? Um, I, I think it calls for a, a whole program. It does, yeah, doesn't it? Well, well, but how do you, how do you so, I guess, I mean, yeah. if, we can, if we can give us, you know, a pearl as far as, you know, what, what have you found that's been a way that you express that right, right, to right, your right. patients so to I, where the, they, that they connect with that? Yeah. So what I do is I said, Mrs. Jones, let's pause for a second. I'm going to talk to you about the, the hostility of the oral environment. Hmm. That's good. Hmm. I like that. And so right there, I let it sink in, and I said, so... And you so, pause. Yeah, you bet. Pause mm -hmm. for effect. You bet I do. Yeah. So, again, Mrs. Jones, hear me out. Think about this for a second. I'm going to talk to you about a few things that you perhaps haven't thought about. The one thing that we do in the mouth, whether we have restorations on teeth or whatever, is something that's called thermocycling. So every day, we'll put some cold beverages and hot beverages or food. So different materials will respond to that hot and cold, this so-called thermocycling. There's an expansion, there's a contraction. And materials will contract uh, uh, or expand at different rates. Okay, so that right there is something we're doing. And think about your mouth as the, the Duracell bunny. You know, think about the, 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 the Super Bowl commercials, like pop, 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 pop. This is how we break things in, in our mouth, right? So, so we're cycling things. So first of all, we thermocycle. Secondly, our mouth is literally a zoo. We have <laughs> all sorts of bugs living in everybody's mouth, okay? Now, these bugs may get organized and, and form colonies, and these colonies now may um, very well affect either A, your teeth, and that's why you've heard about decay, or B, it, they may affect the periodontium. That's why there's the so-called periodontal disease or gum disease, if you will. And so, again, that's basically a byproduct of bacteria that already live in your mouth are being organized. So if you think about this for a second, you guys, I'm now educating the patient. Right. Then I go, um, <clears throat> and we, we function. We, we are utilizing our teeth to, to eat and to masticate three times a day. And so some of us are more careful than others. And then there's the beyond function, what's called the para function, you know? That now, you know, teeth are not utilized in the way they should, and there is excessive force exerted on the teeth. And so you can start to recognize here, you know, again, the hostility of the oral environment. So there's, there are biologic threats, there are mechanic threats. 
a chemical threat. Mm. And so how for a second in, in, in your right state of mind would you be able to say, yes, Mrs. Jones, I'm providing you a solution that shall stay in your mouth forever. Give me a break. Who do you think you are to be able to claim Mm. Such a tremendous lie. Mm. Mm. So again, we have to, and you want to call it revision? You want to? Call, I don't care. However, you want to call it, but it, it upsets me, you know, that we, you know, as a community, are are not doing this because again, we are sending the wrong message. It's so good. It's such a good message to send uh, a, to yeah. your patient, and and I think that is a huge pearl for our listeners, and and for those listening to this broadcast right now, take that to heart. The thing about this classification, and I love the Ricardo rant, as I'm going to call it, (laughs) okay? I love it. I love it because we like to rant about those things because if we don't say it, who will? You bet. Yeah, it needs to be said. It needs to be said. Even before talking about all of this wonderful prosthetic options we have, if Mm -hmm. if we're not setting expectations properly um, for the patient, for the future, and, you know, we're seeing this too as we have a lot of younger clinicians getting out and, you know, People that, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago were learning this as it was being developed. Now Mm -hmm. they're coming out into a world where these options are already available. Right. They've not really seen a lot of the the failures of early, you know, treatment options, figuring things out. And so the idea is maybe more that we want to be able to say to a patient, hey, we figured it out and we know how to do that. And I think before we even get into all the design options, we need to know what – we're too young as clinicians to say – well, we just tell them it's forever because in, in 10 years, 20 years, oh whatever it is, we're going to be facing, well, who pays for this now if there's another, if there's a failure? So yeah, for sure. Now, now to, to bring it to the next level, think about this for a second. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you two things and you'll see the, the huge paradox that we live here. On the one hand, you all have a cell phone. Yeah. We all have an iPhone. By the way, which one do you have? I use Android, Samsung. Oh, okay, Samsung. Which, which, which? I have the Note, the Note 8. But... Uh, so that's been around. Android. For how, that's been around for how long? Are you ready for a change? No. What do you use? Google Pixel. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Pixel two. So it's. I mean, I've had it for. What I'm trying to say is here. You can see that I have an iPhone, but my iPhone X is right there. In other, in other words, right. We all have I'm a the most gadget. latest, greatest, right? Yeah. yeah. We all have a gadget that has. So if you, this is not something new. Actually, this is something that. Um, so Aldous Huxley, who was this thinker of the, the, 19th, the, the 20th century, he said in the mid-90s that the three pillars of Western prosperity were <laughs> armament, uh, universal debt, and something called planned obsolescence. This is awesome. This is getting deep. I'm this loving this. This is really good. All right, because continue, sir. Continue. I'm sorry. Just, this is awesome. Okay. So what does this planned obsolescence mean? In, fa- in <laughs> fact, the term was coined by a designer called um, Stephen Brooks in a World Fair. So we're perfectly fine embracing the fact that our computers, you know, um, our equipment has a shelf life. It has an expiration date. And this is something we're pretty pretty cool about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some tears yet, up, we go buy a new one. And, yeah. and, and yet, huh, how dare we, I'm talking about the patient, go to the dentist and claim or assume that whatever they're getting is forever. Mm. If we're so used to, you know, renewing stuff. Now. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, us as clinicians, and again, I've been around for a while, and you guys have been around for a while, and and for the audience here to think about how long you've been around to think of new um, names around implants. We've all heard of, and we we'll keep on hearing about new surfaces, new connections, new abutments. Keep going. Um, mm. And also, on the other hand, new uh, techniques. So... If you look at, and, and I realize and I commend you for being the, you know, the podcasters that look at literature and look at research, I think you're doing a phenomenal job. Um, if you look at the literature and see how we've evolved from what were the indications, let's, let's, let's move from full arch to a single tooth implant in the aesthetic zone, mm-hmm. okay? So I've been lecturing on that topic for many, many years. And what I used to tell audiences based on the literature and based on, you know, 
the um, meta, meta analyses and systematic reviews. So, you know, when we're doing immediates, what you got to do is you got to get a fat boy. Yeah. You know, do the extraction. <laughs> fill that input, socket, Fill right? that <laughs> socket with a fat <laughs> we boy. We just right? talked about yeah, this. Yeah, we were just talking about this. Right? Yeah. So, and so what do we do today? Exactly the opposite. Right, we yeah. go thin. It's we go zone thin. Socket thin technique powder, now, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, and so, again, I mean, <clears throat> we, we see these things evolving, mm -hmm. and we have to come to terms with that. So going back to what, don't you think... I mean, you said that plastic surgeons or, or doctors say revisions. I mean, guys, technology is amazing, and we have to embrace it. I mean, I, I couldn't be uh, you know, more excited to practice in a point in time in dentistry where we have the best and awesome. greatest toys. But mm -hmm. we also have to understand what these toys are bringing in, and we also understand, again, go back to shelf life. Whichever toy we have to bring the patient uh, to the best potential, you know, solution, we know that that toy right there, that technology right there is going to keep on evolving. Mm -hmm. So you see the paradox mm -hmm. of what we're talking about? And so we have to be careful enough to be able to communicate this with our teams. We have to be able to communicate this with our patients. And we have to fight, you know, the quote unquote, uh, the typical market um, or the advertisement of those that are claiming that, oh, I, I've stayed away from removable or, oh, I, I stayed away from analog. Now, for me, I'm the digital guy. I'm all digital. Again, give me a break. Right. So these, these are things that we have to take into consideration. Now, last week, I was um, presenting at a very nice, uh, the, the 25th anniversary of the Seattle Study Club Symposium, and, and it, this was called the Legacy Tour. And, and, and so I, as I was putting my lecture together, you know, they asked kind of cool thing. They said, if this was your last lecture, what would you be talking about? Mm. So, I mean, I'm 50, so I don't have a legacy yet. You know, I'm, I, I feel You're pretty, young. pretty young. You're young. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You bet we are. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, I like the we. For, 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 well, you guys <laughs> Especially are for me, for sure. I just turned 40. So, I mean, oh, I'm young. Well, you are as young as it gets. Yeah. <laughs> You're as young as me, really. You know. And you are? Yeah, 36. So, oh, you my know. God. Yeah, guys yeah. are very brave. <laughs> <laughs> So, so anyhow, you know, I, I decided to call this lecture, you know, 2018, is, is it still the mind behind the machine? Love so hmm. so I did a little revision of, uh, a review of what I've been, you know, working on for the last 20 plus years and what technology has provided us with, you know? And again, go, going back to this notion of planned obsolescence, going, going back to this idea of, I mean, there is an expiration date. Going back to this idea of the hostility of the, of the, <coughs> of the mouth. Mm. I mean, all these things are so important for us to be able to discuss with the patient. I mean, if we are not good communicators, if the patient uh, doesn't get that we're trying our best to help them, but they have to have some ownership as far as, okay, these guys and the team of clinicians that I'm, that I'm seeing here are doing their best to help me. Mm -hmm. So then whatever prosthetic design you choose, you know, it's, it's a much more um, educated decision. You know, uh, last year I, I wrote um, a piece that, that I just called Utilizing. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the concept of the buyer's journey. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so, so the buyer's journey is, yeah. it's, it's uh, you know, it's something that's called, it's, it's used in marketing all, all, mm -hmm. all over the map. And mm -hmm. So basically whenever we buy something, we go through three very distinctive right. stops. Right? <laughs> we go through the awareness stage. We go through the um, consideration stage, which leads us to the third and last, which is the decision stage. Mm. Well, think about this for a second. When I wrote that little piece, I said, man, this is what we call in dentistry treatment planning. Mm. We start by diagnosing, which means we are now aware of a, what a problem is. And now, and again, my sense of awareness as a prosthodontist or as a restoring dentist could be different than the sense of awareness that a surgeon has or a mm. technician has. And again, this is why at Spear, we foster all this interdisciplinary management of all patients because that way we can provide much more clarity and hopefully aspire not to have as many blind spots as we would otherwise have because there's always blind spots, right? So, so again, that would be the awareness, the, the diagnosing of what the problem is. Secondly, we go to the considerations, and we tie it back to our topic here. What are the potential solutions? So we have a fixed hybrid. We have a, a removal. We have you know, a more sophisticated. And again, what are the things to take into account? Well, we've got LTR. Let's take a look at where the lip is taking you. Let's take a look at where the ridge is. So now that we see all these things, if you want something fixed and the patient wants something fixed, but we realize we have a, a deficiency, and, mm -hmm. I, and I realize we're, we're two minutes. We're okay. No, we're fine. We're, we're fine. We're fine. Yeah. So, so... Then, based on, 
you know, a specific solution that you want, now you got to be able to realize what type of price you're willing to pay to get that solution, mm. Mm. which bites both ways. What do I mean by this? If you have a patient that has, you know, a very mild defect, but financially a patient cannot afford high-end, you know, a uh, fixed type of restoration. Now you're thinking about providing less implants, tilting implants, yeah. doing a hybrid. Now you're looking at, okay, what we know about hybrids is that we need to create space. Right. And if we need to create space, it means we got to remove X amount of millimeters of bone. And I think, yeah, I think as, as you're talking about this, what I'm imagining is these patients who are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, who are going somewhere where they're, Told this is our uh, this is our we have a hammer and everything you is a bet. nail you bet and then what we know we have a great friend who's an excellent surgeon who's now seeing forty year old patients doing quad zygomatic cases <laughs> because when that prosthetic gets to end of life planned obsolescence whatever you want to call it when when the environment is too harsh mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. now there's a failure. Now we're rescuing these cases at an age. I mean, as and as people are living longer, that's exactly the next point I was gonna. Yeah, how to. how far you know how so so what right so what is our responsibility from an education standpoint yeah. as a patient that comes in at age you know pick an age, 40, 50, 60, of saying well we need fifteen millimeters we need eighteen millimeters and that's going to mean removing twelve millimeters of bone. What's that discussion look like? And then what happens in 20 years? It sounds like you have some real concerns about where we're going to be with some of these you, patients. You bet. You bet. You know, this is one thing that, that sticks in the back of my mind. It wakes me up in the middle of the night, you know, <laughs> uh, because, again, we, we, we can only try our best, but we have to um, cope with tendencies with patients that <clears throat> we, we start this discussion saying patients are now aware, they come in and they demand, yes. you know, X, mm -hmm. Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. And the reality is patients may want anything, may, may, may say anything they want, but they come to the expert and you have, to, at the end of the day, you have to feel comfortable with what you're providing. Mm -hmm. Th that's the only way that you can aspire to sleep better at night. Now, um, you're talking about how... Um, what you the life expectancy has changed. Mm -hmm. And with that, again, we now have to be very strategic when we design, you know, the dentistry that we do. And again, I was talking to Darren about this a while ago. And, you know, uh, one of the trends in dentistry today, and unfortunately, sometimes when we say trends, you know, there's a term that you hear, but people don't quite grasp and understand, but they keep on saying it. And, and I'm referring to something that you've all heard, and I'm sure you've had plenty of programs devoted to the concept of minimally invasive dentistry. Mm. Okay. What does it mean to be minimally invasive? Okay. So when we look at a large population of patients that end up you know, needing a full arch on implants, <clears throat> either because they have terminal dentition mm -hmm. or that they're already edentulous, a, a high percentage of these patients are in need for a full arch because there was over-treatment in their lifetime. Mm. There was too much dentistry done, too much aggressive dentistry. Mm. And so um, what, I, what I, I'm trying to hopefully um, say that will resonate in some of your, uh, in the audience out there is to revisit, to rethink because you just said, okay, now what is going to be the contingency plan when we've removed all this bone for these patients? Now we're looking at quad zygomas. There's only so much bone that we can remove. Now we're thinking about, okay, now we have to grow back that bone to be able to go right. back to square one, which I'm not saying we're not going to get there. And, and again, what we have available today as far as, um, you know, gr uh, growth, uh, b growing bone and, and uh, all the engineering with bone, um, you know, uh, development is just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. right? It's getting better and better, which is very, very exciting. But we cannot think that, yeah, you know what, just just remove as much bone as you want. We'll just grow it later. I mean, we've mm -hmm. we got to play a conservative game. And patients, again, have to, have to understand the value of playing a conservative game. Mm -hmm. That's so good. You put it on the table, then, then they know how to make their decisions. And so I don't know about you guys, but when you are, 
We have a patient that's committing X amount of dollars for these type of treatment. And it doesn't <coughs> matter if it's going to be a hybrid, a removable, uh, you know, a telescope or a full fixed. It's a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Right. And these patients do tremendous commitments to come up with that money. Yep. So at least my, in, my, in my mind, we have to make sure that we were as clear as possible for them to understand what are the implications of them going through that. So tell us a little bit about where our listeners can come and hear you in a greater way because yeah. what you've done here is shared your passions. Yeah. And and I really feel like that the passion came across. Yes. Um, and John and I are influenced already to just continue on in what we're doing yeah, and, and even a, better take it to the next level. And it's a challenge, like you say, that we have to – we have to make sure that communication mm-hmm. is clear. But but yeah, so if someone who's listening to this says, you know, I want to learn more about right. <clears throat> not only the communication side, how do I choose my design? Right. How do I take into account this new classification with you know the EFSB, the FGTP, kind of the facially generated treatment plan approach? Mm-hmm. Where do they go? Where are some places here you you know, that about you're involved with, with? You and your relationship with Darren Deister is pretty close. And, and what, what, what are you guys doing that other people can get involved with? So uh, last year, um, yeah, last February, actually, we, we launched our, um, one of the latest seminars here at Spear Education. Uh, so we put together this two-day seminar, which is called Treating the Terminal Dentition or the Fully Edentialist Patient. So it's a two-day seminar, um, which, again, I mean, for me, putting that seminar together meant, you know, uh, looking back 20 plus years and mm. trying to make sense as to what has been, you know, we utilize the term learning curve. I, I, I don't like that term because there's, <laughs> you know, it's a curve or it's, it's like almost like an asymptote. It, you never reach, right? it's, it's almost <laughs> like a line, right? And we're learning more and more as we speak. But, but again, I mean, it was uh, very challenging for us to put together this two-day seminar thinking about, okay, uh, how can we make life simpler for clinicians to see, you know, what are the parameters or what are the, the markers that need to be laid on, laid on the table to be able to treat these patients? Because, I mean, we didn't talk about the amounts, the massive amounts of patients that are in their need for this therapy, mm. but there's a ton. And so you, a while ago you mentioned something that I think <clears throat> is very important, you know. The removable um, word doesn't flow very well with a lot of dentists. Mm-hmm. It's almost like, oh, I don't, I don't want to go removal. Mm-hmm. And so what we, we, we try to do in our seminar again is to demystify. Removal is great, and removal gives us the ability, put it this way, guys, everything that we know in aesthetic dentistry, the blood life of all that information came from removal prosthodontist. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, the, the bioesthetic, the, all, all, all these concepts of aesthetics, you know, tooth position, uh, tooth shape, uh, you name it, contour, arrangement, everything comes from den- all, all the you know classical literature of, of complete dentures. Absolutely. And so we, we do a little review of, about all these concepts, which, again, it's the base of FGTP. That's right. It's that, awesome. That's so what it you know is. It's tooth position. Set eight and nine. We talk about that you, on a show. You, you, you that really it's know the greatest all. thing to be you, you to bet. learn dentures. <clears throat> you bet. And so we start by— It's not super cool, but you know, for, yeah, for most be, people— It may not be sexy. Yeah, that's right. For, to talk about, for people I, that are guys, not used to removable, but guys, dentures are where it starts. where it starts. If Jim Rouse can make airway sexy, yeah. we, we can make tooth position sexy. On, on yes. Yes. You, yes, you, yes, yes, I like that. You, that's you, good. You, you bet. I mean, that's Bring right the there. sexy back in tooth position, that's right. right? Bringing the yeah. sexy back. Listen, listen <laughs> if, if there's anything that the patient <laughs> will interpret as, as us having an artistic eye is, we have a blank canvas. Let me let me let you know where the teeth belong in a blank canvas. Oh, yes. oh yeah. Yes. So it's, for me, it's a very, very cool thing to teach. And Darren does a phenomenal job also covering that, that, that part. So in our two-day seminar, we basically walk the audience through, through those principles. And then we tie it in with, like I said, you know, mm-hmm. this, all this notion of what do we look into? Uh, how do we talk to the patient? How, mm-hmm. how do we um, make some sense? How do we communicate along the lines of, of, of therapy? And then we basically have so many... I mean, patient after patient. It's a very clinical uh, seminar. So we show a ton of patients showing, like, you know, the nuances of 
why is this guy a bit different than this guy? And, yeah. and we treatment plan with the audience. It's a very interactive. I mean, I have the, the time of my life doing that seminar. So, mm. I mean, if, if somebody in the audience would care to join us, I would be more than thrilled to have, have you come. I know we have one uh, date coming up uh, in April. I believe it's April 20th. Yeah, so uh, really the best place to go is spireducation.com forward slash seminars, seminars. And yeah. check it out right there. At any time you're listening to this, uh, just head over to that, that website and you'll be able to And there's up. also a workshop, is that right, too? Yeah, tell us a little bit about yeah, the workshop yeah. because yeah, what's the difference seminars between and the workshops two are for, different. For those right. who haven't been familiar with that. Right, and so the way Spear Education... Uh, works as, as you know we are we are an ecosystem of of multiple options depending on what you know your educational journey is at and where you want it to be so the seminar will give you uh, a ton of information and we're going to walk you through some of the clinical steps for instance um, all those that are doing full arches know about the concept of, of a conversion prosthesis mm -hmm. and so how to do a pickup of once the impulse are placed and whatnot and so we'll talk about that during the seminar but the workshop will get your hands wet. So you'll do the actual procedures during the workshop. Yeah, so there's a lot of hands-on as well yeah, as so the, so the workshop, there's a lot of, of hands-on, and Darren's doing it with another phenomenal prosthodontist. His name is Doug Benting. So they, mm. they have, again, this great, great uh, workshop with great reviews. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean... That's uh, good. So, so by the end of the workshop, you're going to be able to understand how a conversion prosthetic would work? I, I would say by the end of the seminar, you'll understand how it works. By okay. the end of the workshop, you'll be <clears throat> very ready to go ahead and do it. Um, and now, the, you know, the challenge in campus here and in our seminar room is that it's, it's like, think about this for a second. Who is listening today? Mm. Uh, at this podcast, you're going to have specialists. You're going to have people that have been in practice for 20 years. You're going to have younger, young clinicians that are just fresh out of dental school. And so the challenge for us putting this together is that everybody that comes in have to, has to leave saying, you know, they gave me pearls. Mm -hmm. And so for, for me, you know, as an educator, the challenge is how do I gauge the level of the game here? You yes. have some clinicians that have been doing this for 20 years, and these guys are here because they have questions. And for me, it's, you know, it's music to my ears to say that they're spending two days with me for me to clarify some questions and to come up with more questions. So it's awesome to have them in the audience, but yet I also have in the audience, you know, young dentists who have never done this yes. and have this like... Mm. Mm. They earn, yeah. They earn for that 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 case. You know, yeah. they want to do their they first do their one. first case, and they need all of all the basics the, all of as you well. You bet. But at the end of the day, I mean, you guys have taken the FGTP and you've taken the art of uh, treatment planning. Yeah. Same deal. We look at the. We have a treatment planning seminar a couple of uh, weeks away, um, and it's a sold out show. I think we we uh, actually oversold it a little bit. But anyhow, um, you look at you look across the board from the audience, and you see, you know, some young clinicians, some older clinicians. That's cool. And we've, we've all heard the guru, our Frank Spear, <laughs> time after time after time. And the, the beauty that Frank's makes, you know, the, the complex, he breaks it down into ways that, that are easy. But at the end of the day, you, you listen to him, you feel pumped, you feel inspired, mm -hmm. you go to your office, and some people will, will, will be, uh, you know, much more secure about diving in and doing some of the clinical work, whereas others will say, oh, you know, I still have some doubts, I still right. have, and... Welcome to life. This is life. that's right, and they know, but at least they know the questions that they need to be you're asking. Bad. They mm -hmm. know, you know, what they need to be thinking about. And I think that you know, if you're listening to this show today, and you want to get involved with what Dr. Matrani is 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 doing here at Spear, um, you know, I would encourage you go to SpearEducation.com/seminars. Uh, check that out. That sounds like a great entryway if you've not been involved in this type of treatment before, and even if you've been doing it a long time, uh, as as he was saying, there's always more to learn. Um, and we're excited for for what's happening here with full arch treatment because one of the things that we we thought it was really neat when that got added, you know, when we saw that we felt yeah, we like were, that was something we that we that. knew you guys would do it right because that's how things are done here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's exciting to see that expand upon what Spears already doing here. Now another way, do you all do you do any of the online lecture type oh, stuff? Oh yeah, yeah Spear online. You, you, you bet. So um, so some of these same topics we've discussed maybe or you or, bet. or other you topics can be the on platform. there and so. So one thing I'd like to do for our guest mm -hmm. is if you head over there um, and you want to sign up for Spear Online, uh, if you'll use the offer code 
T, as in Tom, T, or the, mm. D, G, the dental guys, 169. That gives you $20 off mm-hmm. per month. The online. And that saves you a little bit of money. And let me just tell you, the online component of Spear Education is a great way to kind of get some of that at your house, you know, right. and, and hear a little bit from the creator of Spear Education, Frank Spear, but then also hear our, our uh, special guest today, Ricardo, talk a little bit about some of the things and the passions that he has in his life when it comes to dentistry. Yeah, what, what it does is by looking at the digital platform is you'll, you will not only hear me or us talk, but you also have the visuals. So, so, yeah. so, so yes. you know, so we create all that. Yeah. And, and, and if I may, uh, just to say one last thing. So, um, and again, we, we never know how things are... Uh, Process and taken by the audience, but I can tell you, for all those of you that haven't embarked in the journey of doing these type of treatment plans and and these type of um, and seeing these type of patients, I can tell you that some of the most rewarding experiences in my professional life have been helping these type of patients. Absolutely. Yeah. And secondly, when done right, I mean they are a tremendous source of income as well. So oh my goodness! This is, this is something that yeah. you cannot or you should not. You know, you create a friend. For yeah. life, yeah, the patient get the, becomes you get a friend. People that you know? cry, people that hug you. Oh my God! Yeah, they, it's it changes their life in a way that that almost nothing else we do really, uh, really does. Th- th- these are like the, 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 your raving fans that go out there uh, talking about you like nobody else does. You they know? come into your office, your team just lightens up to see them, and you they bet. lighten up right. to see you. you it's bet. like, hey, like I like going to see my dentist. Yeah. And uh, so that's what it's all about, John. It is. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for being on with us today and for uh, offering not only some clinical pearls and tips, some communication, but also just, again, your passion comes through on what the future brings, how to be thinking about uh, that long term, that legacy. What does this mean for our patients in the long run? It's challenged me and, and I'm Wes. Challenged. I know it's challenged our listeners, and we really look forward to uh, to what you're doing, to seeing more of what you're doing here at Spare Education. So thank you again for being with us today. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, th- thank you guys. And for Wes and John, we are the Dental Guys. <laughs>